So we've got about 50 minutes to go through 300 pests. So uh, hang on to your coffee and uh, we'll let her rip here. Uh, the starting site, as may, may, you may know, especially in South Florida, is a fi or it was a ficus hedge, but the ficus whitefly, uh, which is, I think, one of the most damaging landscape pests in the country, money-wise. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So when I first arrived uh, in Collier County in 2001, we were battling the Asian Sago scale. So I'm just going to give a little history. If anybody wants the inf any information on here, please email me, uh, Dougbug. It's up in the top right-hand corner there, Dougbug at ufl.edu. And uh, I can give you this history chart. Um, we have the most invasive landscape pests uh, of any state in the country. So uh, you guys in landscape maintenance business are a whole lot more busy planning landscape pest management than those same folks in Ohio. So just doing a quick rundown. Uh, Weeping ficus surfs 2004, pink hibiscus, mealy bug. We're going to run through the key, some of these key pests, but just to give you an impression, the weight of how much has happened in the last 19 years, uh, a biggie with the uh, citrus greening, 2007. And then so there's more than uh, one significant new pest every year. So we're going to hit on a few of these. And for you newbies, especially like when I moved down here from Ohio, I'd have people uh, inquiring, well, what's this? And I go, I'm not sure. I'll have to look it up. So you'll get things. Well, it's hard to interact with this. Uh, you've all probably had questions about these little bagworms on uh, queen palms and royal palm trunks, but they're not doing damage. Uh, they're essentially palm trunk cleaners, that's what I call them. And then you go and look at any phoenix palm other than the uh, pygmy date palm, but the Canary Island date palms, uh, date palms, and you'll see this scurfy-like material on the bottom fronds. And uh, a lot of people think that's mealybugs or some kind of scale insect, but that's actually it's kind of a cool fungus because uh, it's so large. Uh, the fruiting bodies, uh, Graffiola false smut fruiting bodies. So you don't want to be using an insecticide to control a disease issue. So first step, know what the pest is. Identify the pest. And there are some resources to do that with. An older resource is SP235 through the University Extension Bookstore. It's about 20 years out of date, but I really like it. Oh, we have a question coming up. Uh, let me finish the intro. So this talks about insects, diseases, and nematodes. There's a slide coming up on that. And Michelle, I don't see the polling button. Oh, there it is. Okay, so uh, first question, new landscape pests are rare in South Florida. You have a... 15 seconds to answer, right, Michelle? Something like that? Yeah, we control the polling, so we can um, turn it off. Did I launch we it? We see a, a good number of folks that have answered. So go ahead and participate in the poll, please. Uh, well, we've got some people that are falling asleep, I think, already. So I'd say it's about okay. time. Yeah, Doug, we've got almost everybody's answered. Um, we, one more person, one more person, and then we're good. So, oh, you know what? It's me. <laughs> ha, ha I'm in as a participant. There we go. Now everybody's answered. So if you hit end polling down at the bottom. Do I chastise some people for not paying attention? <laughs> yeah. So hit end polling and then um, it'll ask if you want to share the results or you can just talk about it and then hit X on your screen and move on.
X on my screen. I don't want to share. I'm going to be tight for time, so I got to move on. So X on the screen up here. Okay, so yes, uh, we have more frequent landscape pest invaders than uh, probably any place in the country. So that is something you have to be alert to. So in that same booklet, if you look at, uh, for instance, under Heather, it tells you the different key diseases, key insects or mites or key nematodes. So it's a good reference because I always forget about the nematodes. So that's something you gotta be concerned about. Uh, what helps is to categorize what kind of damage you might expect with these different insect pests. Uh, number one, I've got three categories. Number one is there's uh, just an annoyance and there's no plant damage. And I'll give you some examples of all these or ask you what you think. So uh, category two is cosmetic or where we start having some slight chewing or defoliation, but it's not going to cause long-term injury. And category three is a really serious one, serious threat. This pest will kill plants or ruin the aesthetics of the plant. So you need to do something about it. And some of these insect pests will fit into, just one species could fit into all three categories, depending how abundant they are that particular year. So we'll give some examples as we go through here. So um, anybody familiar with Jadera bugs, I get calls on these. I've got ticks on my front screen door. They're gonna invade and suck my blood. So actually, uh, they do like to congregate and it means you probably got a golden uh, rain tree nearby you need to maybe remove. So the Jadera bugs feed on the uh, seed pods or the seeds of the golden rain tree and they're not damaging, they're just an annoyance. Uh, paper wasp, if you've ever been in the middle of a hedge pruning it and uh, been attacked, you know they can be an annoyance too, but they're not damaging, damaging the plant material. Okay, uh, remember how hibiscus used to be able to be a feature landscape plant? Well, we had uh, a new pest show up. When you see those buds going off color, uh, check the buds, see what's inside. In this case, we're looking at uh, hibiscus bud midge and supposedly attacks orchid buds as well. On the right, we've got, there's some caterpillars that will do that occasionally, but uh, these don't threaten the value or the, it threatens the value of the plant, but it doesn't threaten the life of the plant. So you have to readjust those categories, one, two, three, sometimes for different aesthetics and different issues that you want. So uh, while we're on hibiscus pests, you've all seen the aphids on uh, hibiscus buds. Again, it's no threat to the plant's health, but it's going to ruin the reason you bought those hibiscus to have those lovely flowers. So question two. So we go to polling. Let's see. Okay. Michelle, I'm stuck on question one. Okay, there's a little drop down menu next to, let me pull up polls. Um, so, next to edit, you see the little arrow down? If you click Where's, that, I don't see edit. To the right. Ah, somebody just launched it for you. <laughs> it's launched. Oh. Do you see it on your screen as being launched? Yeah, how did it happen? <laughs> um, we can all launch. All the co-hosts can do it for you. you co-hosts. Okay, yeah. so uh, they have 10 seconds. Go ahead and take the poll. The three landscape pest categories include number one, annoyance, number two, cosmetic, and number three, serious threat. This is a good way to help your customer look at different species on their landscape plants, some people freak out with uh, just any insects at all. Okay, so I find keeping those in mind is helpful explaining uh, 
especially category one and category two. Category one, uh, some people are, have that perfect apple syndrome where they don't want any holes or yellow leaves, but the plant's uh, longevity is not going to be threatened. So you don't really need to do anything. And that slides into category two, cosmetic. And then category three, serious threat. And a lot of this also depends on the plant species, whether you're dealing with the hibiscus, which are kind of wimpy, and any pest might cause uh, some grave concern to its longevity. Uh, and if you're look, looking at something like a ficus, at least it used to be bulletproof and nothing could damage it, or there was no, nothing that would damage it. So it depends on the plant's rebound capacity, if you will. Okay, so should we move on here? Okay, so I'm gonna X out and get back to the slides. Oh, the Asian uh, cycad scale or cycad oilocaspis scale that uh, was first um, seen in 1999. It was here to greet me when I showed up in 2000. So this is what Queen Sagos used to look like uh, when the cycad, <laughs> cycad scale moved in. It was very destructive. And here it's uh, identifying the pest is also important because this is a tiny armored scale, which many people thought, well, this looks like downy mildew or powdery mildew. So they were using fungicides, uh, the wrong product, which wasn't gonna do any good. So uh, the scale insect would suck the, the foliage uh, and the dry, there's just, oops. All these tiny little mouth parts, piercing sucking mouth parts. And uh, you can see here's the female. They're sort of shaped like a frisbee. The males are these little skinny white guys. And eggs are hatching from underneath the female covering. And you can see these guys crawling out. They look like mites. That's the first instar crawler. And this is the damage, especially uh, May and September, there were two peak populations. And th this scale is uh, so difficult to control. There's more than two answers actually, and this isn't on the real quiz, but uh, each female can produce about 100 eggs. And uh, this picture shows, I did a test where I was spraying uh, soft products, different soaps, and uh, looking at whether they were alive or not, you had to flip that covering off. You have to flip this covering off, which is real tedious. Take an insect pin and put them under a microscope, flip that covering off, and underneath are these little blobs that are the female scale. And you can see all these eggs she's produced in their hatching and producing crawlers. So this is how you had to determine what was effective. And uh, you can see this is just a half inch section under a microscope. There was over a uh, thousand individuals. So they just overwhelm the plant. And they not only feed where scales normally feed, they feed underneath uh, the bracts and the dead stem tissue and even sagos are kind of unique. They got this layer. It's almost like a sweater, this woolly stuff. And you tear into that and they're underneath there. So contact sprays, foliar sprays aren't going to do you much good. You can clean up the scales on the top, but you uh, will have scales feeding underneath in hidden areas. You can see it. this is very unique. They feed on the roots, probably more in a nursery situation than in the landscape and you'll find them on the uh, pups. Pups are scale magnets and you peel those pups apart. It's like an onion and you'll find scales in the different layers. So uh, the best way to go with talking about IPM is looking at having a predator and parasite. So since it's from a foreign country, these things explode. There's no natural predators and parasites to regulate the populations. But the USDA entomologists did get to go on a field trip and they brought some of those uh, good bugs back. Uh, one was this beetle, 
tiny little beetle. You can see how small it is compared to Abe Lincoln on a penny. So it looks like a little lady beetle. It's not actually a lady beetle, but uh, it turns out they aren't real effective. Uh, this is the larva of this little beetle. And uh, they're kind of like a kid in a candy shop where they're eating the eggs of these scale insects like, uh, like can candy uh, gumdrops just rip it through there, but they had very little impact. So uh, we tried the soft pesticides with the soaps and the uh, different uh, oils, fish oils, that uh, smelled more than uh, they were effective. So I don't know how that's gonna work for you guys. But uh, anyway, we had to start looking at something that had uh, some systemic impact because they feed anywhere on that plant. So. We had merit prior to 2004. Merit does not work on armored scales. So uh, Safari is related to merit, and its common name is Dinotefuran, and it's very effective on armored scales. So it showed up about four years, five years after the scale did, so it didn't help us too much in the south of the state, but it did uh, help in the north of the state where it was slowly the sago scale was slowly invading. So a couple of soil root applications of that a year uh, help uh, eliminate or greatly reduce that scale. Uh, green light's another uh, producer of dinotefuran products. And IPM, look at an alternative plant that has a similar form in the landscape. You can look at uh, dioons very beautiful, slow growing, expensive. They don't get the scale. Agave has a similar form. Uh, in the background you see a queen uh, sago that was ravaged by the scales. So look at alternative plants that don't have the pest problems. Okay, I think we got a question coming up here. Where'd it go? Did I lose it? See. Do you want me to launch the poll? Yeah, here we go. Yeah, please. Question three. It's launched. Somebody did it for me. Okay, it kind of reads a little out of sync there. Should, the small category three white scales. Category three because it is a killer. But what kind of scale is it? It's important when it, you're deciding what, what product to use. Okay, so you all probably remember that uh, imidacloprid or Merit's good on soft scales and mealy bugs while we're talking about it as well. But if you're dealing with an armored scale, which uh, does not produce honeydew, by the way. Armored scale, you wanna select uh, Dinotefuran as a soil root drench. And we like to do soil root drenches because if you're spraying, you're also taking out the good guys. And we'll talk about that more. So if you can, try and do the soil root drenches where you're selecting uh, management for the bad guys that are feeding on the plant. Okay, I see there's a raised hand somewhere. Michelle, are you doing the raised hands or, uh, I didn't get a raised hand icon actually. So I think I'm, we'll- I'm monitoring, we've got Susan and I'm monitoring too. The raised hand is really just for them to identify when you say how many of you have seen, then they can raise their hands. But if they need to talk with us, they need to either put it in the chat or in the question and answer. Uh, Okay, excellent. Okay, moving along. Okay, so aphids, uh, when you see uh, this black sooty mold, which is a product of some kind of sucking up insect up there in that royal palm, it used to be 10 years ago or whatever that it was uh, palm aphids, but with the advent of the rugose spiraling whitefly, it could be rugose spiraling whiteflies feeding up there in the uh, royal palm canopy. So uh, regardless, the pr treatment product would be the same. Okay, so uh, the palm aphid loves these uh, European fan palms. 
So you all know how sooty mold uh, comes about, right? So you've got excretion from the aphids, which is a liquid excretion called honeydew for some reason. And that honeydew ends up on anything down below. And as it accumulates, usually during the winter when there's less rain, less rain or wind, during the summer there's more rain and wind to kind of wash it off. So uh, you'll see it more during the winter. That's when the sooty mold will develop. The sooty mold is not attacking the plant. It's blocking photosynthesis, so it's not something that you necessarily want, uh, both from an aesthetic as well as reducing photosynthesis, but it's not directly attacking the plant. Here's a close-up of the aphid. It doesn't look much like a typical aphid. The little guys do. These are like the first, second instars. And uh, as they settle in, they look more like a type of white fly in mature stage than a, a true aphid, but they're in the aphid group. And uh, this is uh, a good population on viburnum. And you see these guys know where the vascular pipelines are. So you've got the mid rib or mid, uh, mid vein, and then you got these secondary veins. And these are guy, these aphids are like hogs at the feeding trough. So they know where uh, the main vascular flow is. Interestingly, I've, I've never noticed uh, sooty mold on uh, viburnums from these aphids. Uh, a symptom you might see is twisting and curling of the leaves caused by the aphid feeding. This is orange jasmine, and my first thought when I'm diagnosing is, oh, that looks like herbicide injury, but in fact, take a closer look and you'll see aphids underneath. And I call those the curlers. Jude, <laughs> got some background noise here. So uh, another type of group of aphids is what I call the drippers. So uh, here's a bark aphid. He's got a stylet stuck in the vascular pipelines. And you can see he's filtering out different nitrogen products, but the sugars and extra water in those vascular pipelines is just being run through the aphid. And uh, I was alerted to a really cool uh, video by George Zaden, Z-A-I-D-A-N. If you just go uh, to YouTube and search Zayden, Z-A-I-D, and uh, he did a, a cartoon video on uh, aphids and honeydew. And uh, I'm not sure if his sources are accurate, but he says the, the vascular flow in those pipelines is at nine times the pressure that you have in a car, car tire. So nine times a car tire, PSI. So you got some major pressure in those vascular pipelines, which I never really considered, but that's uh, one reason you get so much honeydew. It's just being run through those aphids. And uh, here's Podocarpus gray aphids. You get a lot of honeydew with those guys. And crepe myrtle aphids. Another uh, problem as you go farther north. I, I haven't seen those many, that many aphids on crepe myrtles down here, but uh, for some reason we're starting to use those more. I see them more uh, North Florida and Georgia. Another type of aphid is the woolly aphids, and we see these usually uh, October, November. People get al alarmed about this. Aphids in general, I say maybe a category two. You know, with the way plants grow in South Florida, where you have uh, essentially they're growing 24 7 and 11 months out of the year, it, it's hard to slow them down. So it's going to take something. A pretty major as far as an insect feeding pest to uh, slow them down and cause damage, but we're going to cover a few of those. So uh, woolly aphids are not those. They're a category one aesthetic annoyance. People call in in October and they say, oh, it's like dryer lint. Somebody blew dryer lint all over the lower canopy of uh, my trees. And, and it's like, well, just consider it an extra free holly Halloween decoration. It's uh, nothing to worry about. And it, it's kind of uh, puzzling to me because you'll see hundreds of aphids. You scrape off that lint, if you will, the waxy material, and you see hundreds of aphids underneath there, but I never see any 
necrosis or yellowing or damage, and it's kind of towards the ends of the year, so it's, it's category one, no big deal, who cares? Just an aesthetic deal. All right, Exoras, uh, scale magnets. You can see uh, these guys are pretty covered up with the sooty mold. So that means take a closer look and see what you have. Is it aphids? Is it mealybugs? Is it soft scales? So you can see it's like a red flag, but it's black. So you got a black flag here saying, I've got a bug problem. Come take a closer look. And upon closer inspection, you'll see what would you call these? Uh, well, these are the green scale. Green scale uh, species that you'll see on citrus and uh, different jasmines, gardenias. Uh, it's got a fairly wide range of hosts that will attack. So here's, here's mama scale here. I think this one was either parasitized, this brown one here, parasitized or attacked by a fungus. And from underneath mama, you get these little first instar scale crawlers emerging and they disperse to other areas of the plant. So uh, 2009, Croton scale showed up on uh, gumbo limbo, and you can hardly tell this is gumbo limbo. It's just so soaked in uh, the black sooty mold, and you can see the scale insects on the stems here. So I, I think what happened was when the uh, Rugus spiraling whitefly showed up, it kind of chased the Croton scales off the gumbo limbos, because the uh, spiraling whiteflies like the gumbo limbos, and it seemed like the croton scales moved on to uh, crotons. This was an unknown species to science until uh, I think it was Stephen Brown, oops, discovered it in his backyard. Let me get back up here. That's the rumor. I don't know if that's a fact. Stephen can talk on that, but uh, so here's uh, what it looks like without the sooty mold. Uh, I'd like to say you could use a soil root drench merit on this scale if it's on crotons, because it, I don't consider crotons a nectar plant, but I do consider firebush as a huge nectar plant for bees and butterflies, so you dare not use a root soil drench systemic on firebush. Best thing you can do is pruning and uh, a 2% mineral oil solution spray. So this is definitely a cat category three pest. It will kill crotons and uh, firebush and it can really put a hurt on the gumbo limbos. So uh, if you see these little uh, creatures here, I uh, should have made this a question. What do you think those are? Okay, trying to interact here. Uh, so <laughs> I've had homeowners pick these off and bring them into the office, and they go, I'm trying to kill these mealybugs, but hey, guess what? These are not mealybugs. These are uh, the larval stage of a good guy, uh, of a lady beetle. Just type it in the chat whenever you, um, whenever Doug's asking for answers like that, just type it in the chat. And Doug, don't forget you have poll questions. Okay, yep. Did I skip one? I, I don't know which ones relate to the PowerPoint. The next okay, one is asking which insects create honeydew. Uh, okay, where'd that go? I missed it, sorry. Is it showing? The poll says, which insect does not produce honeydew? I can launch it now if you'd like, if you've already passed that slide. Yeah, you know, part of the problem is this uh, little panel, uh, the Zoom okay. panel sometimes covers up my... Okay, I'm mute. launching it now, so if everyone would go ahead and answer the... Thank you. Mm -hmm. Question number four, which insect does not produce honeydew? So you've got soft scales, mealybugs, aphids, armored scales. Remember the Asian sago scale was an armored scale. And even if you don't know the answer, please answer. This is how we are tracking to be sure that you're on. Um, so, oh, somebody closed the poll. 
by accident. Okay, I'm gonna relaunch the poll because it got closed. All right, sorry, everybody has to vote on this one again. <laughs> Just be careful you don't hit in polling until everybody's got their answer in. But yes, this is how we track attendance. So please, it, even if you don't know the answer, go ahead and answer something and then we'll know you're still on with us. Which insect does not produce honeydew? We have three folks out there. We're, oh, here they come. I'm gonna call you out. <laughs> All right, we're good. Okay, so as you remember, armored scales do not produce honeydew. Okay, so I'm exiting and getting back to these little fuzzy white creatures that look, look forever like um, mealybugs, but they're actually the larval stage of this lady beetle that's trying to feed on your croton scales. Croton scales are on the uh, uh, gumbo limbos as well. So they're kind of cool creatures. Also, the lady beetle larvae move a lot faster than mealybugs. It's another way to determine what it is. Here's what the adult lady beetle looks like of the uh, Species that prefers uh, the croton scales, so that's a good bug. We don't want to uh, kill them with sprays. And then we've got a whole uh, slew of mealybugs in South Florida, and they are a big plant pest group. So the one in the uh, center there is the pink hibiscus mealybug, and that's caused us a whole lot of problems. Here's symptoms on a uh, weeping pink hibiscus. Uh, be just because it has pink flowers doesn't mean it's gonna get the mealybug. The mealybug will attack any color flower, flowering hibiscus. The news media said, look out for your pink hibiscus because this mealybug's gonna cause damage. Well, it's any kind of hibiscus. So it, uh, it's feeding causes a telescoping of the inner nodes it almost looks like roundup damage, as well as these extreme curling and distortion and thickening of the leaf tissue. So this is 2004. They released uh, parasites, parasitic wasp, which has helped manage and almost, uh, I'd say it's not that big of an issue anymore, but uh, it's always gonna be out there. And how do you tell it's a pink hibiscus mealybug? Well, you'll have to, uh, Look close here, and uh, if you've got a little pin, you can jab them and see if their blood, they call it hemolymph, if they leak out uh, pink body fluids. Uh, most mealybugs are yellow or clear body fluids, but uh, severe distortion and death hibiscus, definitely a category three insect pest. And it supposedly attacks these other plants, uh, but I've not seen it on anything other than hibiscus. So there's a story as to why we have that parasitic wasp to help suppress a mealybug on an ornamental. They were getting gearing up for it. Actually, USDA was gearing up for it occurring on some of our field crops. So they were raising these uh, parasitic wasps. I call them micro wasps. And uh, it actually ended up benefiting the landscape industry more than some of these other fruit crop industries because uh, they didn't have the problem. So we benefited. Okay, question four. Let's see my polling. Somehow I went back to question one. Uh, I need to be on four if somebody can rescue me there. We did four already. That was the armored scale. Okay, I'm sorry. So something's popping out when it shouldn't. Uh, I'm gonna exit this. We're not ready for it. Okay, so are you ready to do the black olive tree? Uh, I'm not that question, but I need to okay. talk about it first. So, okay. sorry, South Florida, you'll see, um, the severe staining, you think somebody's radiator blue, um, but this is 
due to some arthropod damage and attacking the, a lot of people call it the uh, black olive tree. This is the shade tree here. You can see the stainings right underneath the canopy outline. And uh, looking at what, it sh what this tree should be called, it should actually be called the oxhorn bucida. If you look at its fruit, which is A, this is the fruit of the oxhorn bucida versus B, this is what black olive fruit looks like. You might recall on your salads. So that's what I want on my salad, not A. So uh, we're gonna work at changing that common name. This is a shade tree you see along the coast. I don't know we, where our, some of our participants live, so you may not be familiar with it if you're a little farther north. So you can see, uh, here's a tree on the left, uh, uh, oxhorn bucida. I'm just gonna call it the bucida tree. No staining under the canopy. Oxhorn bucida on the right, severe staining. So for some reason, uh, the one on the right had the galls. And this homeowner got so fed up with the staining, he used to park a camper here. Uh, he just cut the tree down. So we don't want people doing that. So there's a caterpillar that feeds in the canopy. It'll cause uh, skeletonizing defoliation. We've seen that already down here in the last four to six weeks. And you'll see that staining on the sidewalk. And that's, that's an annoyance or category one issue. Uh, and we get calls of these caterpillars dangling down. We call it the bungee caterpillar. And um, people want to know what to do. And by that time, it's pretty, pretty far along in the biology, the life cycle. It's really not worth doing anything. The caterpillars uh, will feed on the flowers. You can see the notching on the little flower petals uh, by these tiny caterpillars. Each red dot's a uh, first instar caterpillar. So what causes the staining? Uh, a lot of people thought it was the fruit, but it's actually, uh, you get staining from the galls. These galls are caused by a tiny mite. You see it's a flower gall, it looks like a green bean. So the gall alone concentrates the tannins as well as the caterpillar in its frass. So the caterpillars go from free range feeding on the foliage to second generation. They feed inside these galls. They actually become a bore. They tunnel into these galls and you kick out the frass, so to speak. And the frass causes staining as well as the galls will when they drop. But while they're hanging up there in the tree, it's kind of like an old tea bag with drip, drip, drip and uh, the tannins leaking out. So here's what's inside those galls, these millions of tiny little area of mites. And you can't predict which tree they're gonna be on all the time. It's, it changes from year to year. It's not always the same tree. It's kind of erratic. So here's what causes the staining. You see all the fruit here. Fruit's concentrated in the sidewalk, crack it, but there's no staining. So what's causing the staining is the frass from the caterpillar feeding up in the canopy, as well as the galls cause staining because of the concentration of tannin. Uh, so this is a project, we've done about uh, three, four years studies, a couple years in uh, Naples, a couple years at Coral Gables. And Coral Gables unfortunately had canopy tree species. Their uh, major tree was uh, the black uh, horned olive. Ox, um, bucida olive, oxhorn bucida, sorry. So the street tree uh, manager was plagued with calls from the residents, so we were looking at different treatments. Okay, so question five. So if I hit the polling button. Yep. Keeps going back to uh, question one. Okay, I got it. Did I do something? Okay, the oxhorn bucida tree, otherwise known as the black olive tree, has which category one staining issues from time to time? Uh, a, aerified, I don't see the A, B, C. 
I guess they can pick it. I don't see an ABC here. Do I need to do something here? Um, so, nope. Did I mess up the answer for this question? I wouldn't worry about it. We'll just move on because I got 500 other pests to cover. Um, <laughs> you have 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're going to end the poll. Everybody knows that the stains caused by the tiny aerified mites and the galls they create. It's not, and the leaf frass from the leaf chewing and gall tunneling caterpillars. It's not the fruit of the oxhorn beside it. Okay. Okay, moving along. Okay, so we looked at trunk injections and uh, if you have questions about how to control this or what to do, you send me an email. I can give you more details. We had some publications on this. Uh, and you can even use bleach or some other labeled solution for cleaning your sidewalk. And we have a YouTube video on that. So another uh, pest, we'll move along to another chewing pest. Uh, this is a mess above my office window outdoors, outside. Looking at uh, where the Oleander caterpillars pupate. So this is a foliage damage, the oleanders, these, you don't see them every year, but some years you do. Uh, they're kind of cyclical. Uh, they also have another favorite host here with the desert rose. So we have uh, repeating generations. Here's the eggs being deposited by this beautiful wasp. It's not a wasp, but wasp, a moth. It looks like a, a wasp. And the eggs hatch into these orange and black haired caterpillars that feed together. These hairs will not sting you. They're not going to bother you. They're very soft. And there are actually two species of caterpillars. Uh, so what I'm going to do is kind of jump ahead. So this is the adult of the silver spotted oleander caterpillar. Uh, Snowbush spanworm is another one that shows up periodically and can do some serious feeding damage. And if there's no foliage, because there's repeating generations, they feed on the twigs and it almost looks like rabbit damage feeding on the twigs. Here's the uh, adult moth. So it's usually not that big a deal. Um, I mean, they might defoliate the snow bush, but it's not like you have to replace a majorly expensive plant. How much does a snow bush plant cost? Like you can get small ones for four or five dollars. So uh, to me, it's more of an annoyance. Cat one and cat two is definitely damage to the plant. Uh, here's the snow bush spanworm, the different instars. Uh, one of my favorite insect pests is the huge French panty hornworm. How many caterpillars can you count on this one? Oh, we don't have time to count. So um, moving along, uh, the adult moth is sort of a disappointment, kind of brown and gray. And uh, we started a new service at the Cuyahoga County Extension Office. Uh, if you see these, I couldn't tell people to kill them. They're like a small pet. They've got these little uh, beautiful stripes and a little black tail. So question six. Okay, I'm still not, am I supposed to, thank you. Which plant should be scouted for caterpillars? I don't see an ABC. Can they still answer those? They can. They just touch on, on the that. answer. Yeah. And, yeah. Or they have a, a radio button or they can just touch the answer and they've been doing very well at it. There should be an all of the above unless I, I left it out. Because everybody knows right now the two pest caterpillars we just covered will attack snowbush and oleander. So I'm going to in the poll, if that's okay. I got some important pests to, to get to. Poll has ended, so, yep. Okay, so this is a category pest, 
Category three pest serious threat is the uh, palmetto weevil or palm weevil. Uh, just one larva tunneling in near the apical meristem can do a palm tree in. And we think of moths usually releasing pheromones, but uh, some beetle species will also do that. Uh, so then I had a little dialogue on if you see holes in your uh, newly transplanted Canary Island date palm, we also see these on Bismarckias, occasionally on cabbage palms, also on Washingtonias, uh, but they seem to prefer Canary Island date palms and uh, Bismarckias lately. So if you're seeing uh, adults emerge within, uh, it takes 84 days to go from through the life cycle. So if they attacked it after you planted it, I mean, you've got a $5,000 Canary Island date palm and you're seeing uh, holes in your fronds up top, emergence of these beetles at 50 days, you know they arrive infested. But if it's after that 84 day window, uh, they were attacked after they were installed. So a little bit of a benchmark there timing wise. So, and these are just huge larvae. And uh, we decided to come up with, you've heard of pigs in a blanket. Uh, we came up with a recipe called uh, grubs in a blanket. So, you know, when you get a lemon, make lemonade. So uh, another important part, uh, we get, I get a lot of calls on pine bark beetles, especially after hurricanes, people see the sawdust and the pitch. In South Florida, slash pines are stressed by these high wind events and essentially the pipelines inside are being broken and they don't reconnect and it's sort of a slow death. And you can see how this isn't a pine, but you can see what things get torn apart. They call it shakes or cup shakes or ring shakes. So the Ips beetles fly to these dying pines. They are not killing the pines. I've had people spray lots and lots of pesticides on those slash pine trunks and they're just wasting their money, uh, contaminating the environment, and they're not going to save their trees. So if every Ips beetle in South Florida was killed, those pines are going to die from those environmental stresses. Let's see, so did I have a polling question? So question number seven, pine Ips beetles. Do not kill slash pines, true or false. So if you kindly answer that. Do not kill slash pines. Okay, are we ready to move on? Okay, moving on. Uh, Sri Lankan weevil, I'm going to run through this fairly fast. Uh, there was some research done by one of the University of Florida people, uh, one of our district people looking at sp spinosad. Uh, spinosad seemed they have some effect, uh, maybe killed 85% of the uh, adults. So moving on to, uh, let me go back. So remember when plumbagos used to look like that? I'm gonna skip ahead. This is chili thrips. It seems like it's kind of subsided. Uh, this shows the chalk glands on the back of plumbago leaves. It's not a disease, it's not chili thrips, but chili thrips causes stunting and malformation to cause it on uh, these different plants I'm showing you. Duranta gold mound and here's a stunting damage. I thought it was roundup damage at first but they were loaded with chili thrips and looking at uh, orange jasmine being difficult to find because it is it will harbor the bacterium that causes citrus greening and okay, so yeah, interesting. The Asian citrus psyllid here's the nymphs feed on the new growth, 
of citrus as well as uh, orange jasmine and other plants in, in the citrus family. And their honeydew is more like uh, soft serve ice cream. It's semi-liquid and that's pretty easy to spot. There's the adult. Okay, ficus endangered. Uh, so we had a monoculture of ficus and it's like whoever heard of problems on ficus or bulletproof, well, we started having problems. So we had a monoculture too much, which is too much of one plant species. And that's gonna make you, it, it, you're gonna be set up for a big crash when a new pest or disease, insect or disease shows up. So uh, incredible number of ficus in South Florida. Uh, first pest was weeping ficus thrips, 2003. Open up those folded pea pod like galls, you can see it. These are huge thrips compared to the chili thrips, like four times bigger. 2007, we had uh, blister gall wasp, and this is on the Cuban laurel ficus only. And this fact is a good way to identify it. Uh, you can see those galls. A lot of defoliation in old Naples. Cut open those galls, you can see the cells where the wasp larvae of a Jose Fiella developed. That's what Jose Fiella adult wasp looks like. Uh, 2008, we had I spot gall, a fly leaf miner. Here's the larva in that red circle there. I haven't seen as much of that lately. Uh, huge pest, January 2009 in uh, the Naples area. Here's a huge community surrounded, like others, by ficus, a wall of ficus hedge. And a few years later, boom, ficus white fly is killing these. Serious category three, uh, no alternative biocontrol insects were around. And the, the people on the bottom floors at this community were kind of upset because they're right on a major road here and all of a sudden you get the sound and your privacy is lost. So here's what you look for, flip those leaves over. You'll see uh, the older stages, kind of like barnacles on a ship. The hang on, the ficus white fly adults don't live that long, so you'll usually see that symptom first. And here's what not to do. This is a community where you had ficus. I mean, they paid a landscape architect to design this. You had nothing but ficus benjamina, weeping ficus on the left, and then as a hedge in the background in the median, ficus benjamina trees, ficus benjamina on the right, ficus benjamina right hedge. So just nothing but they were decimated. And I can't imagine the treatments going out because there's a low amount of uh, systemic insecticide that you can use. It's a very low quantity. And uh, actually this hedge did recover. So looking at what you can do, root soil drenches with neonics, bark trunk sprays with certain neonics, trunk injections, biocontrol possibilities finally showed up. Uh, we've got green lacewing eggs, eggs on a stick, that's what I call them. That's what the uh, larva green lacewing looks like. There's the adult. And then uh, we started seeing some ladybugs, lady beetles showing up. And there's the larva of this guy. Another symptom is you'll see this mottling on the ficus benjamina. It looks like a citrus deficiency, citrus leaf deficiency, but you'll see this light green and dark green uh, striping almost on ficus benjamina. See a little more pronounced there. And then finally, the, uh, the game breaker, game maker, is uh, this tiny little micro wasp. Uh, the stages on the ficus white fly should be transparent. This is a immature stage of ficus white fly, and you can see it's sort of a golden brown colored. It means it's been parasitized by this guy. A micro wasp, um, scientific name, uh, we just call it the Baleos wasp or micro wasp, parasitic wasp. So this female wasp stings the immature stages of the ficus white fly, uh, the crawlers, second end stars, not the crawlers, but the craw second end stars, and the egg hatches, and, and you get the larval stages of the wasp developing and feeding on this ficus white fly nymph and you'll get those emerging. So we had, uh, we finally had a tag team series of biocontrol insects that I think have 
significantly reduce the impact of ficus whitefly, but it took about uh, nine years. Two minutes to 10. I know you, Stephen. So one of the take home messages, use diversity in your hedges. So here's ficus whitefly hedge on, ridden ficus hedge on the left. And on the right, you've got a viburnum hedge that um, was not affected. So this guy on the right say, saying, aha, you should have planted viburnum, but what are we doing now? We're planting we have monoculture of clusia. So clusia is everywhere. And I don't know if there's a clusia white fly or disease waiting to show up, but you people installing hedges, think diversity, get some different species in there. We have fact sheets on different hedges you can use. Uh, final white fly, Rugo spiraling white fly, that coconuts. It's a giant white fly compared to the ficus white fly. Here's the two species on a penny. There's a Lincoln's ear. So here's ficus white fly. The Rugo spiraling white fly is almost like a small moth. And finally, we got some biocontrol with these micro wasps that were uh, released or naturally occurred. And this is how tiny they are. And o'clock. Okay, Stephen. Okay, here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna launch the final poll. Um, so if you'll answer the final poll, let's take a five minute break so we can get the next PowerPoint loaded and let y'all go to the restroom, get another cup of coffee. We'll see you at 10.05. And here is the poll, please answer it and then you can take your break. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Doug, for your wonderful presentation. <laughs> Sorry, we just ran out of time there. Um, so Steve, Stephen, you should be able to just hit share screen and Put your your presentation up. Trying to get a million hits on Doug Bug himself YouTube channel. Last minute commercial. <laughs> Was that your last slide? Yeah. I okay. Think. Oh, you almost made it to the end then. It should be two hours actually. But <laughs> okay. Perfect. Um, so Stephen, if you want to hit presentation um, mode. This damn thing here. I'll get it. Slide hey share. Doug, mine's the same way. I um, had to pare down a two hour presentation, so hopefully I'll make it. <laughs> it's kind of easier when you're not interacting with an audience, but you still got to speed along. Maybe we could have 90 minute presentations. Let's see, no, 100 minutes, two CEOs. Hey, Michelle, how do I just uh, get rid of all these people looking at me? <laughs> oh, okay, so where the video is up at the top, yeah. um, there should be an, a little line or two lines. If you hit the little line, it minimizes all those. If I hit the little line. I still see Doug. <laughs> well, that's because his video is on. When he turns his video off, okay. you won't see him okay. anymore. Oh, it's on me. Yeah. Okay. I got it. I'm cool. All right. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but we do not see you. So do you want to turn your video on? Yeah, I want to turn my video on. Here we go. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can turn it on. I can ask you to start, but I can't turn it on for you. See, how do I turn that on? Do, do I have to go back? You hit that little video camera next to the mute microphone. I see start my video. That's not it. That's it. Yep. It's got a red line through it. Just hit the red line and okay. there you are. Oh, I guess I can. What do you see? Do you just see me or do you see others? Um, I see you in a conference room. Yeah, that's where I, yeah, that's where I'm doing it. Okay. Okay, so what I see now um, on the participant screen is you in a conference room, and I see your key plants, key pests. Key diseases. I'm sorry, key diseases, yeah, sorry. I'm looking at three different screens. Um, and you know that your polls are up, 
right? So if you hit the pull button down at the bottom and then hit the little arrow down, it looks like you have three poles. Yeah, three, well, yeah, I have three poles. I don't see the pull button. Okay, let me make sure that we've got you as a, no, you're a co a co-host, so you should see next that same um, toolbar that has the mute and the video. It should have a polls button on it. It should be next to the share screen. If you go down to where share screen is, it should have a button there that says polls. I saw it when Doug was doing it. Yeah, and right. She and my, my poll button falls between Q&A and chat. Right. <laughs> yeah. But Stephen, we can, we can launch a poll for you yeah. if you just tell us poll well, one, poll see, two, poll three. As I do this, you'll see where my uh, polls are. It'd be self-explanatory. Okay, we can launch it for you. Okay, thanks. That okay. takes a lot of pressure off me. It sure does. <laughs> Man, I hate this pressure, but... Probably good for me. It's just the first time jitters. You know, it's Doug's last time, right? No, that was Doug's last presentation. Yeah, he's retired. <gasps> Are you still there? Good Doug. Be. Good Doug, be. say it isn't so. No. We've got two months. Oh my gosh. Well, we'll have to do another one. No. Yes. <laughs> actually, actually, Doug, we're going to have your retirement party via Zoom. Yeah. I was thinking about that last night. People wouldn't have to travel. They did that for Les Harrison up in Wakala, had his retirement party via Zoom. <laughs> it's sort of not too uh, sentimental, I guess, but practical. It, it's better than nothing, right? That's right. <laughs> I don't know. I'd rather be on the beach. Okay, well, it is 10.05, so we're, let's turn it over to Stephen Brown, who's our extension agent, our horticulture extension agent down in Lee County, and Stephen's ready to go, so take it away. Okay, hopefully everyone can hear me. I'm going to do this really fast because um, if we did this live, you know what happened. Doug would take 10 minutes longer than he should. Um, I would take another 10 minutes, and by the time you're out there, you're, you would be an hour later than scheduled. So this is live, so we better do something new. Um, this this um, presentation could actually be entitled Pea Plants, Many Diseases, because in many cases, there is not one disease that go with one particular plant. So the objective we're gonna do today is um, condition that cause disease, disease causal agent, major fungal group, uh, bio versus uh, abiotics and examining plants for original cause. So um, three things that can lead to a disease. Actually, you need them all together. It's the perfect storm. You have to have a host. You also have to have a pathogen that's virulent. Quite often we have pathogens on plant, but they are not infectious. Or if they're infectious, they are mildly infectious and you really don't see a disease. And thirdly, we have to have an environment that's conducive um, for the pathogen to spread. So that environment usually, in many cases, is something to do with the wet weather. So right weather um, can do it. So here is a uh, depiction of um, things that can cause diseases. So weather, as I said, irrigation, usually too much, mechanical damage and injury into the plant. Uh, insects can be vectors, they move things along. A plant might be weak nutritionally, and so what we're looking at there are factors that can lead to diseases such as the first one I'll just call bot. Then there are various anthracnose, rust, phytophthora, cercospora. All of these are groups of disease. So if we look at, let's say, downy mildew, there is more than one fungus that can cause downy mildew. And there are more that, there is more than one fungus that call, cause anthracnose and certainly for rust, because that's a general description of the symptoms. Uh, there are many diseases. So this stuff is not black and white, and there are many reasons why diseases happen and nuances. So let's pay good, close attention. However, in this presentation, presentation, the causal agents of what we're about to see have been confirmed 
by the lab up in Gainesville. And I hope everyone will have the opportunity to send your sample up to the plant disease clinic. There are, there are several located throughout the state, but the one that I am um, always sent to is Gainesville. And you gotta pay for the, the analysis, usually it's 40 bucks for one analysis. So disease treatment, uh, if you're not familiar with EDIS, all you have to do is Google EDIS. And if you Google, let's say number PP-202, you'll come up with the professional disease management for ornamental plants. And they will go through symptoms such as uh, phytophthora blight or down your powdery mildew, and they will list chemicals you can use to treat those diseases. So remember, all you gotta do, by the way, this is free, is type in E-D-I-S, PP-202, and I guess you can do UF slash IFAS, but you can do a search anyway. And there it is, same old thing. And this is a great resource for um, finding out uh, what to apply. By the way, in my presentation, no questions are allowed until tomorrow sometime because I got a lot of stuff to go through. Um, actually, I'm just joking. You can do questions at the very end if we have time. So let's start out with woody shrubs. And there is a disease, a big one, and a group of organisms can cause these. That's why you see uh, cholestricum, SPP, meaning more than one species of this uh, fungus is responsible for the disease. But like in many diseases, the same thing kind of uh, follow. The disease can be primary or secondary. Primary means it's what initiated it itself with no support. Secondary, of course, means something may have gone wrong in the plant, such as a mechanical injury, bad roots, too much water, and that's the primary cause leading to the secondary cause, which is the disease. And the disease, of course, can take out the, um, the hose for the plant. Uh, this anthracnose is all over. It's quick to invade foliage, stretched by pesticide burn, mechanical and insect damage, et cetera, et cetera. And what you're gonna look at are leaf spots. The difference between spots and blight is when spot coalesce, come together and become one continuous um, um, link. We call those blights. So blights are spots that, are being, that have combined themselves. So here is a uh, Calusa, Calusia on autograph tree, commonly used as a hedge, mostly so. And this hedge, as you know, is kind of replacing the, um, the, the cocoa plant. Uh, uh, it's a fast grower and it is pruned quite frequently. And here we see, uh, if you look carefully, you can see that there is, let me see if I can use this point. You see these leaves right here? These are effective leaves. So let's go a little bit closer here and you can see the top of this hedge looks fairly good. The middle and bottom is not good looking at all. So there is a disease that's causing this. You see this disease throughout the year, but mostly in cooler weather and especially after pruning. And I'm sure you've all seen this. Here, here it is, take a look at this leaf. So you see where pruning has occurred and you see this little vacuum or cavity here it means it shouldn't be here. The vascular tissue has been compromised. And this is right here. This is more or less a blight. And this is the uh, anthracnose, a uh, particular disease. And remember, you can go to that EDIS publication and they will give you treatment for anthracnose and others. So this is a biotic um, path. Uh, this is a biotic cause. So the, the, the fungal group, we just call it for the disease type or it's anthracnose. This is ficus green island. And you probably mostly, and if not always see this as a ground cover and perhaps a hedge. In reality, this plant is actually a tree. It is a ficus such as ficus benjamina. So if you let it go, it will grow into a ficus tree, but mostly we use it as ground cover. And it looks this good if it looks good. There you go, pretty nice looking plant, you've seen it. In this case, again, you see again, this is anthracnose. So um, you see the bottom and you see the top. Now, if we remember the last slide with the Clusia, what we saw is the disease coming from bottom to top. This is in some cases, 
somewhat characteristic of diseases. And as we go further along, if we have time, you'll see that they may start from below and work their way up into the foliage. That also means when you're um, trying to treat for this disease, take up any fallen leaves as these leaves will fall such that they don't sporulate and the spore carried by the wind will move themselves up into the canopy. So sanitation is a good practice for you all. Don't forget that. And here is a ground cover of the same plant. And this is a Bonita Springs, I believe. And you can see right there, they're not being well established. A lot of dieback. Closer look, you can see, look at this right here. See that? That's not looking good. See, look at that right there. See that? You can tell that's anthracnose. Remember that? Clusia plant, same kind of symptom, but in this particular case, a lot of the leaves are yellowing. And remember, the symptom on one plant doesn't have to look like the symptom on another plant, and the symptom on one leaf of the same plant doesn't necessarily have to look like the other leaf of the same plant. So that's why you got to become familiar with these diseases and these problems. And the best way to uh, check on these is to send in a sample to the lab of your choice, of course. They're also private labs, but um, you know, ours is the best. And um, go ahead, and, and the reason why you may want to do this is because your fungicide that are specifically targeted for specific diseases. And besides, it's good for your knowledge because in 20 years when you're still at this, you can be the expert, hopefully. All right, there you go. And what I did here too is I uh, pulled out some roots, looked at it, and what we found is, sent some up, there's a, 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 a nemat nematode lab, and so I sent samples uh, to let them check for nematodes and let them also check the other lab for a root pathogen. None of these were found. So in this case, we know that the disease is basically a foliage disease in this particular case. And by the way, you see this good looking root here? That probably means there was no pathogen. But anyway, I had 40 bucks to waste, so I did that. They charged me, by the way. Uh, biotic anthrac note. That's why I have to charge you. And here's another disease. Here's another uh, uh, hedge. This is the Nora Grand Exora. Pretty popular. You've seen it all over. And uh, we, we grow this because of those spectacular tropical blue. And uh, I, I, I think in the, I, I see, saw about three or four cases of this where the stem, the stem was actually of the exora split. See that right there? And this is what anthracnose can do too. So as I said, you get all kinds of symptoms for the same disease. And if you see splitting up the stem and all these shriveled up leaves and flower blossom and exora, just, um, can't assume anything, but go ahead in this case, you can kind of think it's anthracnose. I don't want you to be confused by something that happens every winter with exoras, okay? You've seen this and some of the, uh, the leaves still have these spots all over. You might think it's, um, it's, a, it's a disease because it does look like a disease, but truth be told, it is an abiotic cause, meaning non-biological, and in this case, it's a nutritional deficiency of phosphorus and potassium combined. Now, you know what? It's, it's probably not much you can do about this. I guess you can put more phosphorus and potassium in, in, the, in the soil, but uh, in any case, these are gonna drop off as they are doing now, and you get a whole new set of nice green foliage then come again, December, January, February, March, it's just going to happen again. So be prepared. Now, at this point in my regular presentation, I would ask any questions, but we're going to forego that because of, well, here, because I have a question for you. So please answer poll questions one, two, and three. And I don't see the poll here, Michelle. There you go. Thank you. So one, two, and three. Three things are necessary to get plant disease going. They include a susceptible host, a pathogen, and what else? Go ahead and answer that, please. You have nine seconds left. Uh, 
give them just a minute. When there's three questions, it takes a little bit longer oh, for it. No, they have nine sec seconds for one question left. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, all three get answered at the same time. Yeah, Misha, we have a pretty smart audience. They can, oh, yeah. Yeah, they can do all of this in five seconds. So I was being generous. So Michelle, she's the um, she's administering this, and she will tell me when to when she think I can move on. We're almost there. We have about ten, yeah. nine people to vote. Nine more people or to register their polls. Okay, go ahead. Even if you get it wrong, it doesn't matter. We just want to make sure you're still alive. <laughs> so two more people. Yeah, go ahead and answer it. Okay, we're good. I'm ending okay, the poll. Do you want me to share the results? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. See, I'm going through it fast enough. Okay, so we've got, you can want to address the answers here? Okay, uh, three things, of course, you all have the conducive, uh, what is that, conducive environment right? And the second one, what's the answer? I guess it's true. Um, stressed by pesticide mechanical injury. And the third one, do I move this down yet? Is path, uh, nutritional deficiencies are sometimes mistaken for diseases. Yeah, remember you just saw that with a phosphorus potassium deficiency with the exorbit. That's true. Okay, let me move on. Um, okay, I stopped sharing, but you have to exit it on your screen usually okay. up at the top right corner. All right, so as we move on, uh, it's not moving on. Okay. Dwarf Schifalaria. By the way, as you know, they have a green version and a variegated version. It's a foundation plant. We also use this at a specimen plant, small shrub hedge. And I've seen small trees of this. And by the way, if you want to be one of these um, great um, landscapers, try these new things. Make this into a small tree. It actually really does look good. And here is symptom leaf blight uh, and lost stem uh, canker. And a canker, by the way, is basically like a sore on the skin that maybe it's healed, maybe it's not healing, it's an infection. That's a canker. So if we take a look here, this shifalaria, parts of it looks really bad. Look at this. See that leaf there? Look, look at that leaf tip. And look at that um, stem. And the stem has, the stem has, uh, 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 well, it doesn't look good. So again, anthracnose. So we're doing a lot of anthracnose problem here. How long can this continue? The truth is it can continue into, into infinity because these, this particular uh, group of, of disease or fungus, it's everywhere. So don't forget um, B, as you go through this and as you're trying to diagnose problem, one of the things you should think of is this thing here. What is it called? Anthracnose, like your nose. So coca plum, I think I got the species wrong there, but anyway, it doesn't matter. So here's a nice looking hedge, beautiful. I love this. You can use it as a hedge, coca plum that is, or a small tree. And um, looks nice, doesn't it? but you can have this problem. See that problem here? And quite often in coca plum, you may look at a hedge and you may see a plant or two dying that are close to each other. And then you look at the, the, the leaves, you can see these little spots. And what I want you to recognize is that not only can you have fungal problem, bacterial problem, viral problem, but believe it or not, you can have algae or algal problem. So this is, this is an algae that's causing this on plants. So you have parasitic algae, can you believe that? So it's biotic and it will cause stem dieback, it will cause leaves to fall off. And again, when this is a, a, a one of the bigger, one of the bigger um, problems with, uh, with coca plum, it's not so much fungus, it's, algae problems, so don't forget, all right? So as we move along, 
you, you're all familiar with this one. This is a native, this is called beautyberry. It's, we use it as mass plantain. It's not a very good ground cover, okay? It doesn't take well to prune it. Uh, we use it in naturalized areas. It attracts birds, why? Mostly because of these berries that hang on to the plant. Look at that, you got hundreds of berries on a five, six inches maybe. And they're great for wildlife. In the fall, the berries will dry out and the dry berries are still good for wildlife. You will see birds around them. But if we go down here, you take a look at this. This is called model or blotchy. The leaves are blotchy, they're stunted, they're deformed. The new leaves are deformed, uh, defoliation occurs. You see that right there? This is a deformed leaf. Uh, 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 defoli defoliation will occur after. And this is really classical. Let's take a look at the next slide and we'll see. Here you see all the berries are still on, but the leaves have fallen off because of this particular disease and it's trying to plant in this group. They're trying to regain new leaves, new foliage. The disease in this case is cucumber, cucumber mosaic virus, CMV for short of beautyberry. Now, like any viral disease, you all know that the treatment, there is no fungicidal treatment, nothing you can do, no sort of treatment. And the best thing to do is go ahead and remove this plant because in this particular case, if you prune one plant and prune a healthy plant, chances are you're gonna be transmitting the virus to the healthy. And also chances are, you can get insects moving from one plant to the other, perhaps also transmitting the disease, and they may not necessarily be feeders of the plant. So if this occurs, and it occurs in natural areas as well, if this does happen, go ahead, it's viral, remove it, there is no cure. So what else we have here? We're back to the arbicola, our area right here. You, see, you can see this irrigation head right here sputing out water all over the place on their patios. They slip and they fall and all that stuff. Uh, okay, in this case, the disease is more pronounced where the water, uh, where the irrigation is most um, strong. Right here, you can see all of this stuff. So it's probably not anthracnose, is it? Because we already went over that. And if you take a look, it's Phytophthora, Phytophthora root and stem rot. Now, Phytophthora is what we call a water mold. It's in the soil. It's uh, primarily soil borne. So what's happening here is, it's not 100% certain in this case, but there's a good chance it's going from the soil, moving upwards from the roots, moving upwards, infect the stem, keeps going, doesn't stop, and then it infects the leaves. So you have a soil borne disease affecting all of this. So that is why you have to know, should I treat the soil, should I treat the leaves, should I treat both? There you go. This is why you gotta know these diseases. So here it is right here. And you can see, when we say stem, stem dieback, this is a great example right here. See the stem is dying back. And here's the leaf being affected by the same disease. So overwatering will contribute to losses from the disease. And it's most common in poorly drained waterlogged soil because remember what we said, this is a soil borne fungus. It's a water mold, it loves water. It's the right environment. We have the environment. We have, what, what else do we have? We have the, uh, the host. And what was that third thing? Come on. Okay, we have the water, we have the host, and we, uh, what was that third thing? You get old. Um, Misha, what was that third thing? I'm sorry. Nobody's answering. Disease? The pathogen. Yeah, the pathogen. The pathogen. <laughs> the most obvious thing. All right. Hey, Doug, it's about time I retired too, isn't it? Okay, symptoms, leaf spot is chlorotic. When we say chlorotic, it's like chlorine beach. It yellows it, white it out. So these are the spot. The leaves are not as green as they should be. Mid-February, what's going on here? Mid-February, what time of the year is that? Cool weather, dry weather, remember? And sometimes in mid-February, 
the right year, we can have temperatures going down into the uh, 20s. And here in our part of the state, inland, Lee Acres, um, such places, Immokalee, you can get temperatures going down into the teens during the right year. And in this particular case, this is cold damage. This is uh, abiotic disorder. And this happens, and there's another plant where this happens all year, uh, in the winter, that's sea grape. You'll notice that about this time of year, sea grapes will have these spots drop their leaves. The spots are called, the spots are actually disease spot, but they're secondary. Remember we spoke about primary and secondary. The primary cause of these spots on sea grape, pretty popular plant, is cold weather. Cold weather then initiate a particular disease and the leaves fall because of the disease. So if you're in the tropics, generally speaking, where they don't have this cold weather, the sea grape may be evergreen all year. Uh, in our area, they still call it evergreen, but I would call it briefly deciduous. And it's briefly deciduous because of this seasonal leaf change promoted by cold weather than the secondary um, instrument with uh, the fungal disease. Okay, uh, in, in this particular case, using sweet viburnum, and we're using less and less of this um, uh, plant material as time goes by because we have the Clusa as a great replacement, coca plum as a replacement, but this was a bothersome thing. It, it's bothered a lot by aphids, but that's not my talk. I'm gonna show you four diseases, and I have actually had six diseases in which this plant is bothered by. And the reason I'm doing this is to point out to you all that it is not one disease per plant. You can have numerous disease. You may have one or two on the plant simultaneously, or maybe just one. And if you take a look here, these are leaf spot. This is our bouquet viburnum. And this is anthracnose on the awabuki. And there is the bot disease again. Uh, but fungi are not host specific, but can cause disease on many plant species. First, yellowing and premature leaf drop. Second, canker slightly shrunken or swollen. And third, cracked patches of discolored bark. So here we see a uh, hedgerow, half of it basically leafless. And I've already told you what's causing this. Here's a close up. And it is bot dieback of our bookie. So that's two diseases on this poor thing. And here is canker, and these canker almost look like bird nests, doesn't it? Um, in, the, in the twig. And the canker, I don't know if you know, but there is one stem coming up here. The canker is this thing here. And above the canker, you have almost like a witch's broom effect, numerous, um, uh, numerous stem arising from this one stem because of this horrible growth we call a gall, which is the canker, and that's not good, is it? So um, what you might want to do in this particular case, cut back into the good wood here, get rid of this, because you really don't want that anyway, and hopefully things will go right. Downy mildew, that's another one on this particular awabuki. It's related to Pythium and Phytophthora. They're both saprophytic and pathogenic types and distinctly different from powdery mildew. So here's downy mildew, a disease favored by cool, wet nights and warm, humid days. Spores are produced favored by nighttime temperature between 50 and 72. I'm not gonna read all of that stuff as I just did. Mostly they get on the underside of the flea, sometimes a bluish tinge. And um, here you see leaf drop. This is a big deal in uh, our bookie. So many of you may have taken out this plant because this plant looked good, but it had lots of problems, including insect problems, so bye-bye. But that's the illustration. I just want to show you that one plant can be infected by lots of problems. Remember I said we could have probably named this talk, one plant, many diseases, one plant, many problems. So. Um, gray fuzzy growth on the on underside. So this is the top side of the leaf and gray fuzzy growth on the underside. This is, uh, and it looks very classical downy mildew. Okay, 
from offset sleep spot and die back and the pathogen overseas and in the wood tissue, most active during warm temperature. Here's some of the leaves and there are different symptoms to this, but I want you to, I think here, this is where the problem was. This here, right here, the our book, you look good. This very last one, it doesn't look good. Water came off the roof everywhere else and it settled in this area that roots became waterlogged affecting this plant. This, uh, this particular plant. That's the biggest reason, no drainage here, sufficient drainage up here further towards the house, and that's what happened. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so if you take a look here, you can see the wilting of the leaves, you cut open the tissue, and this is what you, know, you guys ought to do sometime. Just go ahead, cut open the tissue, examine it, and you can see the vascular tissue is growing, meaning you're going to get wilted leaves because nothing is uh, making, helping to keep this turgid. <coughs> and, um, and so you get this wilt. So phomopsis and um, leaf spot and dieback of awabuki. So here you go, you get the stem dieback. Leaf will, vascular tissue is ruined. Pith is gone, so no good. So here's the final one, I think, for this. We already went through bot, and um, I guess we're done with our buki. Now we're with the Eugenias. You've seen, as I have, many Eugenias are um, uh, patchy. The hedges are patchy here, there, and everywhere. And again, when you see that, that's probably where you have a canker right here. See how classical that is, classic that is, that's probably a, not a bot of Eugenia. This is actually a pretty common disease of Eugenia, along with rust disease. That's another problem right there. But rust, rust and this, two big problems in Eugenia's, okay? So herbaceous plant, I only have one herbaceous plant for you to see. And herbaceous mean not woody, okay? So lilies are herbaceous, right? Those are a big example of herbaceous plant. We've got a whole other bunch. But speaking of lily, there we go. This is Crangon lily asiaticum and really looks good. What could be the problem with this plant? So here, here are the bloom. And this, this uh, particular plant bloomed basically all year round and it's blooming as we speak now. It blooms better in the warmer weather and this really looks good if it still does. And here we have, you've seen these spots and it will start mostly towards the tip, works its way up and it will consume the entire leaf, the leaf fall. And if enough of this happens, what happened is the plant, it doesn't become defoliated. The, the crinum can withstand the stress of this constant attack if it's in the wrong place. In this particular case right here, this is uh, anthracnose and this is almost the right plant in the right place situation, or you got to put it in under the right condition. And so what happened is, what happened is this, the humidity, the plant uh, planted close together, as you can see right there, can cause this. So anthracnose, and normally what you would do in this case, don't even spray the thing. All you got to do is rip off that leaf, throw it in, a, the, the proper garbage, of course, you know, get rid of it. I guess you can spray. Uh, and don't forget, go to that EDIS site and get that um, fact sheet on what to use. So here we go. It is answered. Oh, I got 20 minutes or so, so hopefully I can get this in. Treatment, removal of the entire, entire leaves or clipping away affected pathogen portion. Okay, anthracnose, we've already done that. So let's look at trees now. So we're going from woody ornamental shrubs to one herbaceous, now trees. This is the gustum, usually used as a small uh, uh, tree. And I mostly see this in landscape, it's still popular. And its biggest problem, this is a pervasive problem. You see everywhere on Circospora, uh, on, um, on ligustrum is this disease, Cercospora. If you see a ligustrum grow, growing 
and you look at the leaves, it's going to have this disease if you check it. Almost 70% of the leaves, 60%, 20%, they have this. You've seen it, right? This is uh, um, Cercospora. It's a persistent leaf spot. Um, and you can see a, a spot of merge cause this dead area here. See that right there? This is the, uh, the disease beginning to become like this. And what happened is, this is the oldest portion of the, the disease right here, right here. This is the second oldest portion, and this is the newest portion of the disease. So what happened? The disease then, this being the newest portion, will continue to spread towards the center of the leaf. It will run into this portion. They will merge, see right there, this is going that way, and they will form a blight. So, and the blight, after a while, you can see right here, blight tissue dies. See that? That's a dead tissue. Dead tissue. And that's Cercospora leaf spot. It happens on other plants. This is a pretty common fungal disease. And this is the start of it. You can see right here, this is the active fungus, and it's going to move out, develop a black spot, then a dead spot. And there we have the problem. You can see the spot developing here as the fungus advances once one yellow portion to the other yellow portion. Here's another problem. This one, this is a treatment on this particular disease. They cut out the interior portion of this um, ligustrum, the woody portion. And by the way, this is what extension is for. You have a landscape problem, we're there to help you and we don't charge you anything. Of course, we don't charge you anything. And so I made this recommendation for them to take this action. And of course, all of this, as I said, all of this, what you're seeing today has been diagnosed by the lab. And so we know this was it. And if you send your material to the lab, they'll even tell you what to do. Can you believe that? Okay, so it's bought. And you can see the wood is dying back here. See that? Doesn't look good. And if you look here, this is the best tissue and this is the worst tissue. Doesn't look good. So die back of the gustrum and treatment prune and discard affected tissue. You can follow it up with fungicide. Here are more the gustrum, dead tree, not so dead tree, grass on the ear. Of course, the landscaper come in. DOT or whatever come in and they will spray the underground here to get rid of weeds. And what we think is happening in this case, you may see the severe case, it's, and, and I've sent this tissue up and some of these tissue have also come back to be bought. So there can be more than one thing going on. But we also think what's going on, look at this right here, unlikely to be bought. The whole canopy is just about gone. That what might be happening it's an abiotic uh, uh, disorder, possibly caused by the use of MSN herbicide, okay? Which are herbicides that are supposed to be selective. But if you read the label, that's why you gotta always read labels, it will tell you, don't spray it around woody ornamental, don't spray it around oaks, because we even seen this decline where MSN has been used around live oak trees. So again, you've got to be careful, read the label. Okay, the Hoon Holly. I used to see this, and that's an excellent tree on the left on in somebody's lawn. I used to see this uh, tree planted, you've seen it, in islands and shopping malls, on roadways. You see less and less of that. Maybe it's a pH problem, you know? It cannot take the stress can it because of soil pH or soil compaction. Remember, we got parking lots. In this case, I don't think there is a compacted soil. It's in somebody's lawn. Look at these berries. By the way, we do know they're male and female trees of the species, right? So this is a female that berries. But if you take a closer look at some of the declining trees in parking lots, and I should have had another slide before this, but you will see galls. Now galls are like these tumor swelling. And this galls is not like the ordinary circular galls. These are elongated galls on the dead tissue. You see that right there? Here's a, here are the berries right there. And you see the dieback 
the dieback is created by this gall. Now, quite often, you won't even think of trying to find galls because you don't see anything circular, but these flattened galls or elongated galls, and here's a tree that I took a picture from. So you see the, 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 the tree dying basically from the bottom. And if you look right here, you can see galls that are still active and are killing that particular plant. <coughs> Don't worry, I'm alone here so I can call. Um, so so this, this is how it looks. So these are the active galls. So this is a biotic sapro, saprorhopsis dieback of Dahoon holly. And let's move on to the next one. So you see this? That's why there, you don't see too many Dahoon hollies anymore. And I've seen, again, a lot of them removed from parking lot. And you know what they put in instead? That probably would work better. Uh, I've seen one case, and I think it's a wise decision. They put in thatch palms, the Florida thatch palms, you know, the one with the, the white uh, berries or droops. And I think that's a good substitute for that in this particular case. Slower growing, less maintenance perhaps. And so a thatch palm in this case would be a good replacement. And it's also native. Now, mangoes, it's mango season. And there's, there are a couple of diseases of mangoes, by the way. And by the way, if your mango tree isn't blooming now or, or isn't producing fruits, I get this call all the time. It could be that this cultivar of mangoes could be an alternate bearer. So you can tell people that, but also, it may, the yields can decrease because of the disease. You see how the spot of this disease is? A famous disease of mangoes. What famous disease is it? Go ahead and guess. Antracnose. So we're back with this antracnose thing. And not only will antracnose get on the leaves, they'll also get on the blossom, they get on the stem, they'll overseason, wait till next year, then make the reap their reappearance. Now, one of the, um, the treatment for this is spray, spray, spray every 10 days when the blossom begins to come out. You know what I think you should do? Find the right cultivar of mangoes because there are some mangoes that are more resistant. So that's what you can tell your customer that perhaps, and, and the blossom, they, they all become black and you know it's disease, but there's another disease that affect mango like that, but I'm not gonna get into it. Hey, Steven. Steven. Uh, several early application, 10 to 20 days apart of sulfur and copper tank to begin with the uh, uh, panicles. That's the blossom there while they're still half size. The blossoms are still growing elongated. Hey, Steve. This you've seen. Steve, woohoo. Can you hear me? How do trees be affected, right? It's a fruit tree like the mango. It's a shade tree like the mango. And look at this here. See all these leaves all wilted out. Sudden and severe wilting of leaves. See, the sudden and severe defoliation then, dieback of stem and bark and death of the trees, all within about four to six weeks. So it's quick. And look at it here. See that? Hey, Stephen. And, and, and the leaves, they, don't, they, they, they die and they stay on the tree for a one or two weeks before they fall. And when you see this, and if you have a customer with avocados, chances are great it's this disease. Now this disease is actually vectored or transmitted by an insect. This insect we call the ambrosia beetle. So what we're going to call this disease and what it is called is laurel wilt because it affects a group of trees we call laurel trees including red bay and, the, and so it affects a lot of native trees in natural areas. Avocados is in this family of trees. It is affected by this. It has negatively impacted the avocado industry, primarily in Homestead, but we have lots of backyard cases of this particular disease. So here is the uh, insect. It carries this disease, and there's a nice story to tell about this particular um, insect. The insect doesn't kill the tree, but the insect moves the fungus into the tree. The, the fungus is always with this insect. The fungus grows in the tree. The insect feeds on the fungus. The fungus itself kills the tree, not the insect. See how that works? Now we also have ambrosia beetle in, in a particular palm species, which I've seen frequently. If you see um, foxtail palm, 
that's not a story. Lots of problems with foxtail. I wouldn't necessarily recommend you planting foxtails. They just have too many problems. Uh, foxtail too also suffers from infection of ambrosia beetle. The big thing about ambrosia beetles is generally they only occupy the first from soil level three or four feet off the trunk. So they're in the lower trunk and you can see sometimes sap or powder coming out of the trees as the beetle leaves, as they exit. So what happened is the adult beetle uh, pierce the tree, lay eggs, the larvae develop inside, they become adults, then they exit. When they exit the tree after the fungus grow and they fed on the fungus, ah, it's goodbye, can't, can't help it. So treatment, no method for stopping spread of this disease. Infected wood should not be moved or sold or used as barbecue, okay? Smoke wood. Wood can be chipped and left on site as mulch. Uh, okay, uh, 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 once again, here is uh, oleander, nice looking tree. And I'm gonna go through this real quick because I don't have much time to climb the tree. And uh, this is what bot does. Remember I said they can look different from different diseases, same disease or same uh, disease, make trees, different plant, they look different. And here is a canker right here. Remember this um, witch's brew. And here is, uh, and in this particular case, this old injury here, see right there, probably may have caused this, and this is the, maybe the primary cause. And every time you see a tree that is supposed to be a tree with a singular trunk, and you've got these little sprouts coming off of it, it probably means that the tree's in trouble. It's stressing out, trying to survive because the top is dying. So let me see if I can turn into a shrub before I'm dead. That's what usually what they tell themselves. Okay, here's another uh, a problem. Uh, this, this is a almost like a, a hedgerow of um, of uh, 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 the oleander. You see the canker right there, and here you can see cut it open, and we got anthracnose again. And, and, and in this particular case, you see canker right here, canker here. And in this particular case, sent it up to the lab. They said it's uh, abiotic, but they also gave me a note. This is what the note said. The problem may be an issue further down the tree from where the sample was taken. In other words, this could be a root rot problem, okay? But the rot and the root or the lower uh, uh, part of the tree may have affected it in this way without the disease traveling upwards. Remember, if you kill the roots, you're gonna kill the upper portion of the plant and the upper portion may be dying without, um, without the, the, the causal agent being in the upper tissue, but it could be in the root tissue. And that is why, remember that ficus that, that I showed you before that was, um, that was in the, 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 uh, the roadway? and I took samples for nematodes and the roots. That's why we do that sometimes. We take samples just to see what could be happening. Now, one, one quick thing, let me go through this real quick, Ganoderma, not only in palms, but you see right there, gumbo limbo, and uh, real quick, you see the old comb. This is what happened. Ganoderma, whether it's on other species other than palm, affects the lower portion of the palm. And remember, Ganoderma causes a dry rot. It starts on the inside. By the time you see this here, the cums, the cums are what we call fruiting bodies. It's a mushroom. And here, right there, is probably beginning to release spores uh, as it gets a little older. And what I want you to take away from this, I've seen Ganoderma, as in this case, on strangler fig, you see some of the crook of, or, or, the wash, uh, or, or the bark of this uh, ficus tree, which is a strangled fig. Here we see the bark peeling off in the live oak, but if you took a closer look on the same tree, you can see the Ganoderma mushrooms, and they will be letting go spores like crazy. And here you see a dead royal Ponciana. We get closer to it. You can see the problem right there, and you can see the conks right here. So remember, if you see problems, Ganoderma is not necessarily a palm a problem only. And I always get asked this question. If you see Ganoderma with palms, don't replant that same area with palms 
for palms infected with Ganoderma. Now, I will tell you, since these are different species of Ganoderma affecting different types of plants, and by the way, this one that affects um, um, uh, live, live oak affects red maple and other species, the same exact one. But generally, it means you can, uh, where the palms have died, you can put this oak into where there was a Ganoderma infected area with palms because the Ganoderma species are different. You got that? Okay. So yes, don't replant with palms in an infected area of Ganoderma with palms, but you can uh, replant with something woody, whatever that is, coca plum, whatever you want to do. So please answer poll question four, five, and six. Michelle, can you do me the honors? Okay, remember, go ahead and answer it. You got 10 seconds for all three questions. Okay, Stephen, we did have a couple of questions. Uh, can you hear me? 10 seconds each, 30 seconds. Stephen, can you hear me? <sighs> Steve, Even can you I'm hear not, me? My coffee is finished and I'm still drinking out of the cup. <laughs> Bad habit. Okay. Hey, Michelle, you're trying to reach Steven. Yeah, Stephen, 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 can you hear us? Okay, it looks good. <laughs> no, I don't think he can. I don't <laughs> know if his speaker is off. Right. So the second, uh, is it everyone? No, no, we had someone that did. The second question, Ganoderma only attacks palm? Well, that's not true, is it? And the third question being, what is the name of the beetle that, what is this, transmit or vectors Laurel wilt, the laurel wilt disease. So what is that beetle? See there, you got, you got all kinds of beetles, right? Most famous around here is a palmetto, well, that's a weevil, pal, palmetto weevil. So, uh, okay. we, do we have most of this, uh, Michelle? We, we have three more people, two more people. Hmm. Can you hear me, Stephen? Who's my pollster, anyone? Okay. I don't think he can hear us. No, I can't I, hear anyone, so I'm going to move okay. on. Yep. <laughs> I am. I cannot hear anyone. I think he probably matter. turned the volume of the speaker down. Okay, we got to go through this real fast. Let me get control of my PowerPoint. Ground covers, we're going to go through this fast. One of the big problem with ground covers is a sore bone disease. Let me tell you right, what it is right away, it's rhizoctonia. Um, this again is a water mold like Phytophthora, crown or stem rot, is sore bone, born fungal pathogen diseases, common occurrence in bedding plants, causes damping off of newly planted bed. Damping off is when something new, you put it in the ground, it just dies off of a fungal disease, we call it damping off. Avoid overhead watering and make sure you space plant uh, far apart to encourage airflow, which will cut down on the disease. Here is a native um, planting of mimosa. You've seen it before. And here is another location of the uh, area. The attempt is to plant it with um, that, and this is what happens. So rhizoctonia is a big thing. And in that area, even though it's a native, remember, natives aren't bulletproof. She could not establish it in this area because of rhizoctonia. And here, if you take a look right here, you can see the same side where big patches of sand and the stem just can't do it. So, you know, in this case, I just tell people, look, don't try to treat the, for the plant. And you can if you want, but use a, uh, switch the plant. Here they use a particular plant called uh, Liriope. And you can see right here, if you pull up these leaves, they come right out of the plant, right? You've seen that before. In this particular case, there are two problems. Number one, rhizoctonia on the roots, and number two, phytophthora crown and root rot. That's why you could pull it out of the stem because the phytophthora has killed, basically detached it from the, from, the, from the plant itself, the leaves from the plant. So two problems. And I see less and less of this plant being planted. And, and it's actually a good ground cover but I see less and less of it being planted. It's not a background cover, perhaps too much work. So both of these are biotic. Here is a railroad vine. And by the way, 
If somebody want railroad vine, just tell them if you get four or five years out of it, you got five or four, four or five years, um, uh, that's about it. Maybe seven years and that's about it. Cercospora leaf sprout is the problem on this one. And here you see right here, this is the bottom of the, of the ground cover and quite often they will plant it as a ground cover and the bottom get infected before the top and this is a mess and they of course took it out. And I've seen golf courses, they plant this and it looks good for a while and it looks horrible and basically nobody, hardly anyone plants it. I don't care if you're on the coast or if you're inland, landscape wise, this is a problematic plant, native or not. So Cercospa release spot, it also has other problems. Let's quickly go to rust diseases. Rust disease affects a wide variety of plants. And rust is basically the spores coming off the disease. And rust is just a description. It's almost like a description of the color of the spores. And the, and the rust doesn't have to be rusty for long. It can be later on become black. Where the rust was, you get a necrotic or dead spot or dead area. But it is an obligate parasite and it depend on a live host for growth and development and it seldom kills a plant. I don't know about that, it can kill a plant, okay? In some cases, in some cases, all rust produce powdery mass of spores and pustules, like pus. Okay, uh, pustule typically on leaf underside, that's true, pustule develop lesions, which may coalesce, resulting in large dead areas. Everyone's seeing this every year, you get your um, frangy pangy, and then about October, November, uh, this is 2nd of January, the tree become leafless by January, February. March, you get new leaves, same tree uh, in March, and you get flowering. You know what? They ask for a, a fungicide. Look, just by the time you spray, it's too late because you see the fungus already capturing the tree. When that happens, it's already too late. And if you had to keep this with leaves, you almost got to spray like right now or even before. But if you look closely at this tree right here, even leafless, you can see the fungal, the rust already on the limb of the leafless tree already. So it's there all year round. And here you see, look, see there, that's my thumb. You can see the rust right here. Very typical, very, and it will spread coalesce to get dead spots. Frangy pangy rust. Please answer the last two questions, seven and eight. Can we do that? And man, I, I, I have some more fabulous stuff. So this is actually a two hour class, if I had my way, because you see how fast I